all go there on average four to five times a day, and yet not everyone is equal with regards to toilets. In developed countries, they're everywhere, and they use vast quantities of water. But that water is drinking water. It has been collected, purified, and transported at great expense. The wastage of such a precious resource seems unacceptable in this day and age. In Europe, they are the one who invented the flush toilet, but they are not changing anything. I think it's time to reinvent its toilet. Reinvent them, yes, for those that have them. But for the third of humanity with no access to toilets, what do we do about the health crisis? This is a container of human feces. Inside there could be over 200 million uh, rotavirus, 20 billion Shigella bacteria. So in places without sanitation, you've got way more uh, than that. And that's what kids, when they're out playing, they're being exposed to all the time. Before this challenge, faced with this taboo, it really is time to take a look at toilets from the other side of the lid. In Roman cities, public toilets were a convivial space where the users took advantage of the moment for a chat. This innovation ended there. In the Middle Ages, there was a complete break from this Roman influence. In Europe, up until the end of the 19th century, it wasn't uncommon for people to relieve themselves in public. In private, the bourgeoisie and nobles used chamber pots, either directly or through chairs with holes. The contents of the pots ended up in the street outside, sometimes along with a warning cry. Mrs. Angela Lee looks after the Gladstone Pottery Museum in England. In this ancient ceramic factory were made a good number of the chamber pots of Great Britain. In the 19th century, public defecation was a lot more tolerated in some ways because it had to be. Cummings is the first person to have patented a toilet, but he wasn't really the inventor of the toilet because his design wasn't very successful. These first water closets, patented in 1770, were a sketch version of the modern toilet. The man who successfully invented a toilet, more like we know today, is Brahma. This is a Brahma closet, and it flushes by lifting a handle which opens and closes a flap to get rid of your waste, and that would stop the smells. Dirty water was poured into a river. In London, it ended up in the Thames. The Houses of Parliament are right by the Thames, so they were the people who were getting some of the worst stink smell, so bad they were going to leave. But they could do something about it, and what they decided to do was get the engineer Joseph Basil Jett to build huge sewers alongside the Thames to take the waste further away. Before there were sewers, City dwellers drank the river water which ran through the cities. They died in masses from cholera, typhoid and hepatitis. People have always needed toilets, so yes, disease was a call to action, but really it was more about keeping us away from smells and thinking about it. It's quite unthinkable to leave an unpleasant odour in the loo. Imagine the shame. In the 20th century, sewer systems became widespread and hid excrement from sight. Thinking things had been dealt with, the old continent and the Americas stopped innovating, unlike in Japan, where users have high-tech, comfortable seats suitable for reading and meditation. The Japanese and South Koreans have a real culture of cleanliness, a true passion for toilets. This cultural relationship changes their attitude. The sophistication and innovation of their toilets is always getting more and more advanced. The Japanese are modest, especially the women. They don't want the noise to be heard when they pee or anything else, so Otohime toilets were invented which mask the sound of peeing. Thanks to this system, no noise can be heard and water is economized. 
少なくなったわけです。So we developed Otohime, a device which generates the sound of a toilet flushing for 25 seconds, and that works. This is no joke. Toto, the maker, is listed in the Guinness Book of Records for the number of its patents. Its star product is the Washlet, developed in 1980. Adapted to different practices around the world, the seat has a jet of water for cleaning. I think the Toto washlet could do well in Europe. It's very agreeable to have this little fountain playing on your bottom. Almost unknown to Westerners, the washlets or toilets with a cleaning jet are a real technological advance which increases hygiene. The research and development department at Toto imagines and tests new solutions ceaselessly. An anti-adhesive coating, always clean, powerful and efficient evacuation, remote control piloting, numerous options are available. Heated seats, deodorizing, secure automatic closing. Although water in Japan is nowadays abundant, it is already lacking in temperate countries where Toto sells its toilets. In any case, water treatment constantly increases in price. We have to economize. Before 1960, our toilets consumed 20 liters of water. Since then, technology has improved, and nowadays they use just 3.8 liters. In the West, our toilets use on average nine liters of water. Only the most recent are equipped with a double-button flush control of three or six liters. On the other hand, the smaller flush is often insufficient, even for a little paper. Our latest toilets succeed in saving water thanks to a tornado flush, which cleans everywhere. Contrary to what people think, it's not the amount of water used which is essential, but the way in which it is used. Thanks to this system, we can evacuate all kinds of materials with very little water. We've also invented a new kind of toilet lid that stops urine from coming out when a man urinates sitting down. In the land of the rising sun, a lot of men make an effort to urinate sitting down so as not to spray the lid and around it. Urine and excrement contain precious information about our state of health. Renaissance doctors knew this very well, and the examination of stool and urine was their main means of diagnosis. Ten years ago, Toto directed its research towards medical assistance. Some models analyze urine and aim at assisting senior citizens preoccupied by their state of health. Others are capable of detecting pregnancy and to give information on the female menstrual cycle. These intelligent toilets are mainly installed in clinics. This toilet can measure your weight, evaluate arterial pressure and the glucose levels in urine. Then show all this on a computer. I'll give you a demonstration with test urine. The glucose level in the urine is a little high. This level is measured by a retractable bio-captor installed in the upper part of the seat. This captor was developed by Professor Karube. This bio-captor, which we've installed in the toilets, is a system which detects the glucose level in urine. From this level, we calculate the blood sugar level. Will the use of this type of equipment become widespread? For the moment, intelligent toilets haven't had the success that was hoped for. The first limit of the biocaptors is their lifespan. Usually, the chip has to be changed after 150 to 200 uses. That's the problem. 
The second limit is due to the current health system. If doctors had accepted the glucose level in urine as a reference, everyone would have bought this system. But at present, doctors still require the glucose level in blood and not in urine. At 6,000 euros each, intelligent toilets for urine were too expensive and clashed with the lobby of doctors. Japanese scientists are now turning their research towards the large intestine. I want to develop the toilet to see what kind of bacteria is living inside your body as quickly, simply, and in as cheap a way as possible. So, to extract information for bacteria living there, we need poo, because poo is better than pee. Fecal matter, in fact, contains a lot of bacteria from our intestines while urine is sterile. These bacteria inform us about our microbiota and, as a consequence, about our state of health. Professor Yamada's project is to design an intelligent seat adaptable to any toilet. The washlet, that is, you know, you can attach the washlet onto your toilet. The washlet is, you know, you can attach the washlet onto your toilet. That is, I think, the best. If you can attach equipment to extract the fecal information from your toilet, and then you can send the information to the cloud, you can analyze the data, and then you can see your information on a smartphone. The close links between microbiota and health are starting to be established. Colorectal cancer, diabetes, obesity, and also Alzheimer's cause anomalies which are found in stool. Nowadays, some can be detected, and research is being actively pursued to detect other organic changes at an early stage, which would increase the chances of cure markedly. If you can do this in a toilet, if you, can do this you don't, in a have, toilet, to to you don't have to go to the hospital, to and you don't have to send your poo to, to the company, company because they can, because they can recognize your profile, your profile from your, your toilet. toilet. Then they say, yeah, you should then they take say, this drug. Yes, or you should take this say, drug, yeah, or so the supermarket says, yes, you should eat this food because of your profile saying you should eat this. That kind of feature will come, I'm sure. For toilets to become health equipment, populations have to accept this, which means that a profound change in mentalities would have to happen in many countries. In Japan, where toilets are the object of a cult, this has been happening for a long time. This is Ususama Mayu, the god of toilets. He is there to protect our bowels from illness. This is an ancient Japanese toilet. And people make a wish by putting a coin here. They wish to be in good health in the toilet. It is because the god of toilets is always at our side that the Japanese have developed high-tech toilets. Undergarments are marked to prove they are under the protection of the god Mayu. This god of toilets has the power to transform that which is dirty to clean and is placed today as a protection in the toilet. Some families, when inaugurating a new toilet, place the god Mayu on a cushion, sat on the bowl, and they drink green tea and eat rice cakes. The god of toilets doesn't really exist, but we take care of the cleanliness of our toilets as if there was in fact a god. That's the ethos. Japan thinks, rightly, that toilet culture contributes to the image of their country as being at the forefront of the health and hygiene sector. Japanese products, in which are expressed the technological advances made in other domains, are an economic advantage. 
In South Korea, doubtless through imitation of its great and powerful neighbor, which largely inspired Korean industrialization, toilets are a cutting edge product as well. In Korea or Japan, I think we have really good technologies. They have like a good thinking of the poops or toilets. So we don't have really like a bad minds of that. In Korea, we have like a theme parks of the poop concept. At the couples, they think it's really romantic place. In Seoul, which in Bloomberg Agency's ratings occupies the envied spot of the most innovative city in the world, the interest of youth for toilets is clear in hip cafes and plain to see in the streets. The residence of Saim Jaduk, ex-mayor of Suwon, a town close to Seoul, is built in the shape of a giant white toilet with shiningly white polished ceramic. This is Sim Jae Duk, the founder of our Mr. Toilet House. He built his house to celebrate our foundation, the World Toilet Association. This building has become the center of the WTA, the World Toilet Association, which has been at work since 2007, promoting hygiene and the end of prejudice. European people think that toilet is only toilet, but Korean and Japanese people consider it as a cultural space. For example, the Korean and Japanese people enter into the house, they remove their shoes, and also when enter into the toilet, they need another slippers to use that. One, two, three, push. The education of the toilet begins earlier in Korean and Japan. For example, in three or four ages, it can create toilet culture. The Koreans have had their sanitary revolution as well and now talk freely and without shame about their toilets. This starts in nursery school. There are over 500 books about the toilet culture in Korean. Mr. Shim Jae-do was born in the outdoor toilet of his grandmother's house. And he used to be called Ketungi, literally means doggy poop when he was a child. And he played a leading lore to develop the toilet culture when nicknamed Mr. Toilet in his later year. Starting from Japan, passing through South Korea, the cultural and technological toilet revolution reached Singapore several decades ago. In Singapore, Jack Sim is another hero of the environment. At 40, this accomplished and charismatic ex-businessman created the WTO, the World Toilet Organization. Like its Korean cousin, it informs public opinion and raises funds for innovative projects for those that desperately need toilets. Sometimes they call me Super Lou, sometimes they call me Mr. Shit, but a common name, Mr. Toilet, now it's stuck. I'm very happy because it is a name that can be used by everybody to promote toilets all over the world. Jack Sim is crusading to open minds to the subject. The last item that is a taboo is the toilet because nobody want to speak about the toilet. So I want to talk about toilet because if we don't talk about it, we cannot improve. Jack Sim likes to put himself on stage for the cause. To break the taboo, we use the humor. 
Come, come. Come, come. <laughs> the media loved it. And then the media wrote so much about toilets, a funny subject which make people laugh to a subject that people listen. Because when they laugh, they listen. Jack Sims' clowning, his cheek and offbeat humour now offer him a global audience. In the 2013, the United Nations adopted our founding day, 19th of November, as the official UN World Toilet Day. The message is sometimes spread by somewhat old-fashioned means, but the UN is convinced that everything has to be tried to end the unbearable scandal of the lack of sanitary conditions, which every year hits millions of victims, and that the waste of water in developed countries has to stop. Mr. Bill Gates put more than $200 million in changing the technology that this kind of movement would never have happened before the toilet subject is legitimized. I want to talk to you today about toilets. Bill Gates moves from computers to loo paper. A decade ago, I didn't think I would be able to tell you so much about poop. Uh, I definitely didn't think that my wife would have to tell me that in some cases I'm talking too much about uh, toilets. Our goal is to create a, a multi-billion dollar business opportunity uh, that at some point is getting by uh, without any sort of philanthropic grant money, that it really just evolves uh, into companies competing to buy the best product. To start up this virtuous cycle, Bill Gates launched a competition with his foundation so that scientists could completely reinvent the equipment which really hasn't changed much in two centuries. Terrible. But where were our toilets technologically before Bill Gates financed their innovation? Separating urine from solid waste and using one or the other instead of sending them to a treatment plant is a promising solution. Urine contains many nutrients, and since it is sterile, can be easily recycled. But fecal matter is loaded with pathogens and so more difficult to reuse. No mix toilets, developed in Switzerland 20 years ago by the research center Earwag, are designed to collect urine and stool separately so as to reuse them. Nomex toilets are a new generation of toilets where the liquids are separated from the solids. All toilets in this modern building are Nomex toilets. As soon as you sit down, a valve opens here in the middle. And the urine now drains off to a storage tank in the cellar of the building. As soon as you stand up, the valve closes. And the urine remains concentrated in the tank. You can now flush quite normally. In numerous cultures around the world, men urinate standing. But in Northern Europe, it's not unusual for men to urinate sitting. For the moment, no mixed toilets are only found in Northern countries. Beyond the restraints of culture, concentrated urine badly coats drains with scale. However, this technology offers many advantages. It stops nitrogen from urine entering the water supply and also means that precious fertilizing elements like phosphorus can be recovered. An organic fertilizer made from recovered urine is sold in Switzerland and Germany. In France, some vineyards are testing fertilizer made from human urine. But there again, there are restraints to the reuse of urine. Although it is quite sterile, it may contain medicine residue. Anyway, the population often are psychologically opposed to using our own matter for growing food. This repugnance appeared quite recently because for a very long time, human and animal excrement were the main fertilizers used in agriculture. 
but the youngest amongst us have forgotten that. Even though the concept is an old one, dry toilets to recycle human waste have always had fervent supporters. For a long time, dry toilets were that, a poo, a little sawdust. Then we went on to something else. Dry toilets of today, on the contrary, are now at the forefront of innovation. In these new generation dry toilets, fecal matter is taken on a moving belt and stocked in this reservoir. Urine descends by gravity and is stored in this container. In reality, the storage for urine and excrement are hermetically sealed boxes. A powerful ventilation system renews the air and removes the smells which used to haunt old dry toilets. Go on, Pete, Bernard. Urine is collected and directly reused, drop by drop, to fertilize nearby plants. This type of toilet is installed in major urban centers, notably Paris. These toilets are now common in collective spaces, concert halls, ski stations, sports complexes. Some private citizens have taken the step too. So Christian, how long have you had this put in? Well, a bit over two years. What sort of savings have you made? Well, listen, it's about 30 cubic meters a year. That's 10 cubic meters per person. That's a lot. In Germany and in countries of Northern Europe, the separation principle is already used in housing. In France, some pioneers are clearing the way. So nowadays we manage to install this type of toilet even in housing blocks, notably with our first try at Dol de Bretagne, where there were 24 units, that's 60 people who are to be equipped with this sort of separation system, which permits treatment of all the waste of 60 people. In terms of Dol de Bretagne, it's public housing management in charge of the project, and so that proves that even institutions are starting to change, which we can be happy about. Fecal matter is collected once every six months from the unit to be composted outside the building. The urine is collected in the basement, takes up about the space of a car park place, and is reused by a local market gardener, which means that it's completely possible nowadays to put separating dry toilets inside buildings, even on several levels. This technology is particularly adapted to new urban zones constructed at the edges of towns and close to fertilizer users. Difficulties in stocking and transporting waste remain a real restraint in towns. Water saving and reuse on site of products recovered are the themes which current research is investigating. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation supports the work of several scientific teams which are exploring different ideas. Notably, solutions for urban zones are being studied, which don't have sewers at all, and where basic infrastructure is defective or even completely absent. In England, the team of Angela Parker from Cranfield University have developed toilets that are totally autonomous, function without water, and produce their own energy with our waste. The nanomembrane toilet has a rotating bowl which acts as a flush, which keeps odours trapped within the toilet and stops them from spreading. The excrement falls on a trap door that pivots on its axis when the user has finished. The base of the toilet is then blocked and no smell can escape. When you go to the toilet, um, in Europe, you flush the toilet and your waste is transported to a sewage treatment works and there's lots of different processes that happen in a sewage treatment works. When you use a nanomembrane toilet, all those processes are contained in a small footprint unit and converts it into uh, clean water and ash. 
A worm screw sends the solid excrement into a mini combustion chamber which produces energy by reducing it to ashes. The liquids are filtered by a nanomembrane with extremely small pores, a millionth of a meter, which let only water pass and hold back substances carried in the urine. At the exit, perfectly sterile water is obtained which can be used for gardening and other domestic uses. So the toilet is designed to work in low-income cities where there were no sewers, so it needs to work without access to water or electricity because those are often scarce in those areas. And the only thing the user has to do is uh, open and close the lid and empty the water on the, and the ash. Another highly qualified team from well-known Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, has designed a recycling system. A French startup has developed the Caltech technology to industrialize and commercialize ecological toilets that are water autonomous. I'm going to present you autonomous toilets which don't use water and, on the contrary, produce water from urine. There are no chemical byproducts. All excrement is recycled on site. These are WECO toilets, normal water toilets. And behind this is technology. The urine and excrement come to this septic tank, where they're biologically treated, which allows the decomposition, reduction and digestion of solid waste. Liquid goes into the electrolytic reactor. You can see the little bubbles, which is the process that allows the destruction of bacteria and water clarification. And this leads to clear treated water such as we're used to, which is then filtered and sent to a tank to be reused for flushing the toilet indefinitely in a closed circuit. Like in swimming pools, electrolysis creates chlorine by combining wastewater, salt, and electricity. This chemical reaction produces clear and sterile water which can be reused indefinitely. Finally, fecal matter can be recovered at the bottom of the tank to be transformed to compost or energy. At the moment, the first toilets like this are in service in public structures or installed in private homes that aren't connected to the sewer system. Water in France isn't expensive, so we have a tendency to look upon it as an inexhaustible resource. We're connected to sewers everywhere. In the 80s, everything was supposed to be connected to the network. That's why we now say, free ourselves from that. We have all the infrastructure, but on the one hand, the water resource isn't inexhaustible. The rivers which bring our drinking water will drop by 10 to 40 percent. Also, maintaining a treatment system is extremely expensive, and in environmental terms, there are a lot of leaks, estimated at up to 20 percent. So our technology will be useful for tomorrow in France, but it is useful already right now in developing countries where there is no sewer network. India is an ideal experimental field for prototypes that aim to break away from classic toilets. A symbol in itself here where the construction of millions of toilets has become a national priority and where ancestral practices are firmly rooted in the most disadvantaged layers of society. There are only four toilets in this shanty town, which has 15,000 inhabitants. And each morning, there are just too many people, so I always go to the toilet outside. The World Health Organization estimates that 80% of endemic illness in the country is associated with the lack of hygiene and dirty water. At present, 800 million Indians have no access to toilets. I've always done this. I feel better when I'm outside. My intestines work better. I don't like being enclosed. And there are smells in the toilets as well. Here there's fresh air and you can sit down naturally. The problem in India is that there was 
no culture of using toilet for hundreds and hundreds of years. They use to open defecation and it becomes a mentality that this is normal. Now to change this, you can build the toilet. But you have to change the behavior to use the toilet. Various NGOs, as well as UNICEF, are launching communication campaigns with a funny side on Indian television channels and mobile phones. Let's take them. Let's take them. One of the great unfinished goals of Gandhi was to end the practice of going to the toilet in the open air. At the launch of Operation Clean India, the head of government promised the building of 110 million toilets. Still today, our mothers and sisters have to go outside to relieve themselves. Is that dignity for women? In rural areas, going to the toilets is a nightmare for women. Their modesty leads them to distant spots which are isolated and sometimes dangerous because of wildlife. Women who don't have toilets in their houses have a lot of trouble. For example, at night, if they want to go to the toilet, they're scared to go out. Outside, a lot of women get attacked, often by men, so it's very dangerous. When there are toilets at home, there's no need to go out, and we're safe. At the start of her marriage, Anita didn't have a toilet. Putting one in was expensive and very badly looked upon in the neighborhood. A deeply rooted belief in India is that toilets are a dirty and impure place that offend the divinities that watch over the household. If my husband hadn't built toilets, I would have gone back to my parents. So I would never have had a family or children. And all that life. And all that life. My life would have been wasted for him as it would have been for me. Anita's struggle to have a toilet was reported by many papers and made into a film. The film with a star-studded cast called Toilets A Love Story was enormously successful. It brought in 2.16 billion rupees at the box office, which is more than 28 million euros. And more importantly, it had a big effect on ordinary people, especially with women who identified with Anita's character. This story is the real story of our life. Yes, it's true. They made a very nice love story about toilets. When people see the film, they'll be inspired. About toilets? About women who are still suffering from this. The neighbors always thought I was a strange woman who went back to her parents because of the toilets. And when I came back after making my husband build a toilet, the neighbors said, if she could do that, we can do it too. And little by little, all the village had toilets. Anita's story showed the way. But there's still a long way to go. Traditional Indian society is structured by a hereditary caste system that determines the trades that can be practiced. The untouchables, the lowest social caste, are responsible for cleaning toilets. Our Prime Minister said, Our Prime Minister toilet said, Toilets more are more important than, than temples. Than temples. Than temples. Hmm. So, let's go. Temple. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>
For 40 years, Dr. Patak has been called the toilet guru and has devoted himself to changing the image of toilets and that of the untouchables. Gandhi gave importance, Gandhi gave to, importance to toilets. He said he, he, said he wanted independence, independence India for India later on. Later on clean, clean India, India first. first. Everything to do with excrement is impure, and it cannot be manipulated except by the untouchables, the caste which is the most discriminated against and despised of India. Today, his NGO reclassifies the untouchables, giving them back their dignity. They are the persons who... They are the people who used to clean human feces till 2003. 2003. Now, now they've, they've become, become free. Now they, have now they don't have to clean human feces. Now they get now education. They get education. <laughs> In spite of recent legislation which forbids old-fashioned toilets where the tank can only be emptied by hand, they exist still. And it is still untouchable women who empty them. Devi empties the family toilets of this house once a week. I've done this job since I was very little. I was only this tall when I started. Each tank only brings in a few cents. Sometimes the mistress of the house, with the tips of her fingers, offers a snack. I always keep my distance. The untouchables have no right to go to the temple, nor, worst of all, the right to use the public baths. So this system or this practice this system and this continued practice continued for 5,000 years for five till the British years. came to till India. British came to India. They put up, they put up a sewage system in, in Kolkata, Kolkata in 1870. But uh, the technology, but the technology was, so was so costly, it was not possible, it was not possible to, end to end the practice of manual, manual cleaning, cleaning by untouchables. By untouchables. I had to find out I had to find a solution to the technological problem and also the social problem. Several decades back, Dr. Patak imagined and developed revolutionary toilets, simple, inexpensive, and which didn't need to be connected to a sewer network. There are two pits. One is used at a time. When the first one is full, switch over to the other one. The contents of the first tank then was used as fertilizer for crops. The technologies, the technologies which, I which I invented, they're all, all free, free from, from patents, patents. So, the so the poorest or the poor person, person can utilize them, can, can get the use of our technology. The facilities of our technology. The unit cost of installation varies from $20 to $500 according to its complexity. The most developed produced by fermentation in a cylinder, enough biogas for a household's needs. Hello. Dr. Patek tirelessly promotes the construction of public toilets accessible to all. First public toilet. The first public toilet was opened in 1974. People used to joke. And people used to joke. Who will pay for the use of toilets? But now, but now, 20 million use them every day. If we have proper facilities, clean bathrooms, nobody minds paying a small coin. Paying a small coin. Sulab, the NGO founded by Dr. Patak manages around 10,000 public toilets. 20 million units have already been built, either by the Indian state or private organizations. The objective is to build 100 million, at the same time experimenting with new concepts. This is, e -toilet this is the e-toilet app. Can People can easily find where the nearby e-toilets e e are. And also the devotees can, like, upkeep and maintain the e-toilets through this app.
Two toilets can be connected to three options. One is normal sewage-like, it can be connected. The second one is we have a dedicated on-site treatment system which is using anaerobic treatment. As its name indicates, anaerobic treatment takes place without oxygen, like that which happens in a living digestive tube when it decomposes food. And the third one is we're in the pilot stage of integrating a Caltech reactor to the e-toilet for recycling of water with the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Eight percent of e-toilets are trying to integrate the Caltech system. This system works with solar power. And also in the future, we will be trying to produce electricity as well as hydrogen from this reactor. What we need to do now is to ask people to see the toilet as a status symbol. Like a Louis Vuitton handbag. We have to drive the demand and then we have to make them use the supply. The industrialization of the production of sewerless toilets and the development of technical processes will bring about a fall in prices which one day can be brought within the reach of the most modest households. India will then have the hygienic revolution that Gandhi dreamed of. Some regions of Africa lack both water and the necessary infrastructure for treating waste. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has helped to develop the first mini water treatment plant called the Omni Processor. In many African towns, but also in Asia, waste falls into old fashioned tanks, which have to be emptied regularly with more or less mechanized methods. Up till now, the waste collected was often thrown into the rivers. Installing an Omni processor treats and converts the waste from 100,000 toilets in Dhaka, Senegal. Here we transform every day 12 tons of fecal matter taken from emptying solid waste into ashes used to make biofertilizer, steam, to produce electricity and distilled water, which can be used in motor vehicles. I am very impressed with this solution we're seeing here. It generates electricity, it generates clean water. It will grow to every corner of the earth that needs it because it makes money every day. It's water. Solid waste is heated to more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. Organic pathogens are destroyed and the steam produced drives turbines, which generate the electricity of the complex. After exiting the turbines, distilled water is collected. According to its designers, the machine can thus produce around 11,000 litres of drinking water per day from an abundant and inexpensive resource. Please, humans first. The toilet revolution is happening. Technical processes keep improving and industrialists can see there is money to be made in a sector that is freeing itself from the preconceived ideas that stopped its development. And we're just trying to work out which company um, has the best skills that match what the nanomembrane toilet needs. So um, I'm very confident that in the future the nanomembrane toilet will be able to be manufactured in, in its millions and uh, deliver safe sanitation to the people that need it the most. The UN Sustainable Development Programme has as an objective guaranteed access to toilets for all by 2030. I'm very optimistic that by 2030, India will have no more open defecation, China will have all flush toilets with good treatment, Africa has high priority on toilets, and all of European funding will help this change. Jack Sims WTO is raising more and more funds to finance ambitious projects. Research is moving ahead in every direction. Scientists are actually 
they didn't understand exactly what it was that made toilets smell bad. Women need to deal with the subject of toilets because toilet education for children is transmitted mainly by women all around the world. And I hope that thanks to that education and training, we'll end the taboo. Anita has been seduced by modern toilets. Wow! Nowadays, with new generations and the change in mentalities, new technologies, we'd like everyone to go to the toilet organically. Okay? And Dr. Patek has produced a Bollywood clip for Toilets for All. Hasket the cat, hasket the cat, hasket the cat,